So, when your mom and dad meet, and some of you have seen this, you have an egg and a sperm. And you know why we have so many sperms per one egg? Because the guys never know how to ask for direction. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the sperm, one of them finally hits the egg. It's now a fertilized egg. It becomes like this. It becomes like that. And before you know it, it becomes like that. <laughs> now, imagine how many cells this woman has in her body. She came from a single cell with the same genetic information. And she has, does anybody want to guess? 10 to 70 trillion cells in her body. And these are more than the national debt of US and Europe put together. <laughs> Imagine, they all have the same, the same genetic information. Now, have you ever thought about what 70,000 cells look like? The number 70,000? It goes and goes and goes, and this is not doing any of the things I expected it to do. So you have to watch my TED talk. <laughs> so we decided that it is really important to find out it, it actually, after my old age, you know, I have been doing science for 40 years. This tells me I can never take anything for granted. I should have actually gone and looked at their slides. My assistants send the slides and they're all scrambled. So what can I say? All right, here is a human breast. We ask the question of how does this 70 trillion cell, all with the same genes, make your nose, make your finger, make your breast, and for the gentleman to listen, make the prostate. So, how do they do it? And we decided that we really know nothing about this, and what we are going to do is we are going to have to make a model. We chose the mammary gland, that's actually a picture of the human mammary gland, and this is this beautiful three-dimensional uh, structure of one of these things in the human breast, and around it are fat, but we have about seven or eight of these. And we decided that even that was too complicated. Um, and what we are going to really concentrate on is to concentrate on what we call an asinus, which is what the mammary gland makes when an animal gets pregnant. You have one layer of beautiful epithelial cells, one layer of what we call myoepithelial cells, and then around it, what we have, what we have is something that I knew nothing about and I had to learn about it. So we have over the years, my goodness, over the years asked the question, what actually makes a breast breast and why when you take the cells out of the breast and you put them in the dish, why do they forget where they came from? So here is a picture of a single mammary gland or breast from human breast. You see how beautiful it is? It has very lovely structure. It has a bottom, it has a top, it has a secretory activity. You take these cells and you put them in the dish. In about two days, every one of them forget. They were making gobs and gobs of milk. They had fat droplets. They were making the milk coming out. They were doing all sorts of wonderful things. They are polar, they have a bottom, they have a top and these forget. So it says that the cells wants a nose or wants a breast or wants a prostate don't always remain a nose or a prostate. So the question is what actually gives them the information? What makes them do this, right? So you look, for example, at the nuclei of these, you see this is in the dish, this is in, in vivo. You put these things in the dish, they forget to make milk. So we ask the question, why is that? So if we do a section of the mammary gland of the mouse, we see that around these acidos is this red stuff which is called extracellular matrix. And these extracellular matrix component are like collagen, huge molecule. People believe that these things actually give you structure and they don't have information and signaling, 
And I decided that because they lose it, maybe what the cells didn't have in a tissue culture dish was actually this material. So we actually put and found a material that we were able to put these cells in that material. They could bring it around themselves. They could make a three-dimensional structure. In animals, they look like this. In 3D culture, they look like this. And once they find their three-dimensional architecture in this gelatinous extracellular matrix gel, they now are remembering, hey, I'm a mammary gland. I'm a breast. I know what to do. So we believe that the basis of organ specificity in all of you, when you look at yourself as a miracle in the mirror, is the architecture of that organ. There is wisdom in your nose, there is wisdom in your liver, there is wisdom in your breast, and it all comes from the architecture. Now we can make this gorgeous looking thing full of milk inside this three-dimensional structure, and you can imagine I had a picture of me when I had one of these big birthdays with a big mustache of milk, saying, we got milk. Okay, so we can make these lovely structures of human or mouse breast, and we can do all sorts of other things. This was supposed in the beginning of my talk, and it has come now, so I'm not going to pay attention to it, only to tell you that that's one of the most clear examples of why when people get cancer and everybody tells you that they have had a single cancer gene that is going awry and is giving them all these cancer is not correct. You take a cancer gene, this famous, famous virus, you can put it in the chicken and it gives you that tumor, that ugly tumor, you put it in the embryo, which we did. Here it is in this beautiful feather with these blue things, and it turns into a feather. It just finds a different home. So it says that the context in which a cell finds itself is absolutely dominant over your genome. So your genome is not necessarily your destiny. It's a lot of your destiny when you're born. But once you're born, the microenvironment of those genes are dominant over the phenotype. This is really a pity. So we made a hypothesis. We said if this architecture is, in fact, the most important thing that happens, we should be able to take a cancer cell, give it the right context, and they should think they are normal. Alternatively, we could take a mouse, destroy the structure without giving them a cancer gene, and they should become tumorigenic. And we have done both of these, and I don't have very much time to tell you except to show you. Here are the non-malignant cells in, in an assay or in an uh, experiment that we have developed where they make this beautiful structure. These are the nuclei. This is the cytoskeleton. They make an assonance. Here is malignant cells, and when we took these malignant cells and we measured what was in the surface, we found out that these malignant cells, in fact, did many of the things these do, but they had completely lost the balance of what is at their cell surface. So we took an antibody to one of the um, molecules that actually signals to the extracellular matrix and brought the level of that molecule to the level of normal, and look what happened. They all became normal, completely turning the cells into a cell that is a, a structure that is normal. If we put this into the mouse, while these make 100% tumor, the whole structure makes zero tumor. If we dissociate them and put them with this antibody, then they get 70% less tumor, and it takes for months before they do it. It's very exciting, as you can imagine. And this is the assay. We have shown and we have done this. And you can see here on the left, every one of those are like hundreds and thousands of human tumors. And on the right, these are tumors that got reverted to a normal phenotype. It's absolutely exciting. All right, so the conclusions are that growth and malignant behavior are regulated 
at the level of the architecture, and I will tell you that you get Alzheimer because the architecture of the brain starts going, and you get problem with mammary gland or the breast because we age. Aging is the biggest risk factor. So form and function are related dynamically and reciprocally. This was a beautiful thing that was going around like this. I have no idea, Jeff, what happened, but uh, honest to God, oh, there it is. Look at it. So form and function are related dynamically and reciprocally. You mess up one, you mess the other. It's like yin and yang, right? All right. So where do we go now? So the thing that for you to remember is that as you are sitting here, in every one of your 70 trillion cells, 70 trillion cells, this is going on. Every cell has to know where they are, and their context has to be correct. They go from in to out and out to in, and I call this the model of dynamic reciprocity. OK, now, look at this. They made this discovery very recently last year where you put one of these things in a gel. This is human breast adult cell. In order to make that structure, we discover the whole new movement. It does this incredible stuff that you just saw. And we have a very beautiful paper that shows that when the normal cells know what to do, the malignant cells don't. But when we revert them, they attach to each other, and they start doing this movement again, so they make the correct scaffold on which we are now able to build that structure again. And this is going to be very important in bioengineering human tissues. So I want to finish by a poem that I love from Yeats. I always um, debated, do I want to be an English major or do I want to be a chemistry major? But at the end, uh, science won, but I love the literature. He says, Ooh. He says, oh, chestnut tree, great rooted blossomer. Never mind. Here is the important thing. How can we tell the dancer from the dance? It's among the school children. How do you tell the dancer from the dance? Here it is, this beautiful Merce Cunningham with whom I took some lessons. And as you see, when he's dancing, he's a dancer. When he stops, He's neither a dancer nor we have a dance. So is with form and function. So is with the structure of your nose and the structure of your mouth and why they don't turn into each other, thank goodness. But at one point, somebody took a cell from a sheep called Dolly, right? It came from a mammary gland. So that cell in the mammary gland had all the information to make all that sheep. So you can imagine that we could one morning get up and have two heads, and thank goodness we don't. But if you, <laughs> so here is my group, and that lovely gal in here was my physicist who discovered that particular movement, and I like to say she was in the right context. She came from Trinidad, and her father was an engineer, her mom was a mathematician, and when she was born, they said, you're going to be a physicist, you're going to be a physicist. You're She's a brilliant physicist. And it's not because physicists are that much smarter. We have bad physicists, I know. But she is brilliant. And I have had three other postdocs who were physicists. So context determines everything, including you and me, including how we respond to each other. Well, this is my favorite uh, cartoon. So I used to be the cat, and this was the authorities, right? And the authorities said, don't you dare think outside the box. I couldn't get money. People thought I was crazy. And now I always lecture to the young people and say, always think outside the box. Always think outside the box. You have only one life. Leave it well and do something good. And I'm proud to be a member of Lawrence Berkeley Lab. It's a great place to be in. Thank you.